Welcome to Transcendent Psychotherapist. I'm going to introduce you today to a man who I think is perhaps a bit of a revolutionary in science, perhaps the new Einstein. He is Professor Don Hoffman from UCL Irvine in the States, and he is giving us a new theory of a model of reality that suggests that consciousness is the primary foundation of everything that really is there. Now, he's not just doing a flight of fancy, he grounds it in mathematics and he's saying his mathematical modeling also gives you the kind of it predicts accurately all the things you would expect to see or you know in the universe not all of them I guess but the sorts of key theories that we would hope to see so I'm going to introduce you to Don in a second and let him speak for himself but just to give you a little bit more background about his work so he's written a book called The Case Against Reality in which he makes the argument based on um, computer modeling but also just kind of um, looking at the way evolution works to show that evolution doesn't give us a, a realistic picture of the world. So the world that we see, the 3D space-time world that we see, um, is not the way the world actually is. And in fact, he says that if we, uh, as or any creature, were able to actually see the world as it really is, we would basically not survive. The evolution has designed us not for truth as such, but for fitness. And the kind of metaphor he uses for this is what's called the um, the icon or the dashboard metaphor of your computer screen, your desktop, the desktop metaphor. So just like when you do your, you know, you clicked onto YouTube today or what have you, um, you might have clicked on a, an icon to get onto your browser and you might have clicked other buttons to do this and that. Now, you might also have like a little trash bin somewhere, like a blue trash bin, and you might drop things into there. Now you, if I asked you, is that trash bin actually there? Is it actually a real trash bin? You'd be like, well, no, of course not. There's no actual little trash bin in there. Um, it's just a picture to show me the function. If I, if I do this, if I drag this to here, it will get rid of that thing, that document or what have you. Actually behind all of these icons on our desktop are loads of kind of diodes of electronic signals zeros and ones and what have you and we would never be able to operate a computer by dealing with the full reality of what really is going on in terms of computing and so it's similar don hoffman argues with the way we see reality when we look at this this is a radical thought you know when we look at the moon when we look at space when we look at three dimensions when we look at each other when we look into brains and see neurons um all sorts of things when we look in the mirror and see our face we're seeing a interface a user interface okay this is not actually what is really out there and if you reflect on that for a minute like you think about yourself like so if i if you took a brain scan of my brain you would see well hopefully quite a lot <laughs> you'd see like neurons and stuff like that maybe like flashing up and firing and, and so on all right but What's my experience of what my brain is? It's nothing like that. So you can have like the inner real experience, the inner reality, which we know the inner reality in ourselves to some extent. The inner reality um, has a kind of, it's, it's not the same thing as the physical representation of what it looks like as, as we stare across it through our evolved perceptive apparatus and this is what he says basically evolution has given us an evolved interface to see the world but what's actually behind there is based in consciousness so the next clip i'm going to show you is of don hoffman kind of explaining his theories to uh, robert lawrence kuhn from uh, close to truth it's an amazing series check that out because that's some amazing stuff on there robert lawrence kuhn interviews philosophers uh, scientists, all sorts of thinkers from, you know, famous people from across the globe on really big, interesting questions. But Robert Lawrence Kuhn here is interviewing Don Hoffman, who he, I think, seems to respect. He's, he's, he's interviewed him a few times um, on this question. So let me hand over to them explaining what he thinks. Right. And that's what evolution has given us. It's given us pixels that we interpret as neurons. And for everyday neuroscience, it's perfectly fine and it's, it's very helpful to talk about neurons as having causal powers. It's only 
when you really have to understand the deep workings of the system, like with the hard problem of consciousness, that that fiction now comes back to bite you. So for everyday neuroscience, yes, neurons, you can think of them as having causal powers, causing our experiences and our behavior. But just like for a system designer for a computer game, you, 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 know, you have to lose the fiction to write the game and understand how the game really works. Uh, what I'm proposing is to understand the hard problem of consciousness. Now we have to give up the fiction of space-time and causality within space-time. That fiction, which is perfectly fine for most everyday science, is what's biting us here in, in solving, the, solving the hard problem of consciousness. We have to have a deeper theory, which we explain both consciousness and how then our experience of space-time um, emerges. Now this finally gets to the question you asked, which was I was saying that evolution by natural selection in our current physical theories like you know, quantum theory and general relativity would be theories on a deeper theory of consciousness. So the reason I'm going there is, is, is the following idea. I, I can't start with space, time, and matter as the fundamental reality, right? They're just the game. Evolution has given us the game. Those are just the symbols of the game. So if I want to understand how neural activity is related to conscious experiences, I'm proposing, and this is now the leap. This is independent of my work on evolution. So you can buy the work on evolution and throw what I'm about to say out the window. Or the reverse. Yeah or, yeah, or vice versa. You can throw, them, you can throw everything out the window. <laughs> but you can throw them out for other reasons. But what I'm saying is, if you want, I would like to solve the hard problem of consciousness. So let me start with a mathematical theory of consciousness on its own terms. So I'm not trying to ask what properties of neurons could cause consciousness. I'm not interested. I'm asking myself the scientific question. If I knew nothing about the physical world, I just wanted a theory of, theory of consciousness. What would be the mathematical structure I would write down on consciousness? And what dynamics would I write down? And now, for it to be science, whatever I come up with in my theory of consciousness has to um, lead to testable predictions. Well, the only testable predictions we can have are back in our game, right? Back in space time. So that's why I'm saying whatever theory of consciousness I come up with, when I, I have to show you how that projects back into what I call our space-time user interface. And when I project the theory of consciousness in this dynamics, I better get back something that looks like evolution by natural selection, general relativity, quantum field theory, or even deeper theories that show that there are special cases. If I can't do that, then my theory of consciousness um, is wrong. Okay, so yeah, really interesting bit there. What he's basically trying to solve, he says, is the hard problem of consciousness. So for those of you not familiar with it, many of you will be, so forgive me if you know what I'm talking about here, but if you're not familiar with the hard problem of consciousness, it is the philosophical problem uh, and the scientific problem. How do we get and how do we explain conscious qualitative experiences? You know, the smell of a rose, the beauty of a sunset, the taste of coffee, the smell of garlic, etc. How do we get qualia or qualitative experiences they're called qualia out of sheer just bits of matter just mere physical stuff and it's a problem that is uh has plagued philosophers of mind and scientists for decades and really literally they've got nowhere with it on the current theory so what don's trying to do here is saying look rather than trying to bang our heads against the wall with with the same old theories what about we see what happens if we place consciousness as a fundamental thing and develop a kind of theory of consciousness um, and how it might interact so that we can then see, is, can, can we do mathematical modeling on this and see if we can still uh, use that to predict, does it have predictive power for showing kind of how the actual world turns out? So if it's our base substrate of reality rather than like matter and matter and energy and space or time you know or or even quant the quantum field if consciousness is the base reality can we do the maths can we do the modeling and still get out of that the kind of world that we see at our level and what he's tr finding that he'll talk about in other videos in a minute is yes he can uh, looking at next the way in which all theories have assumptions so you might be listening to this and thinking okay well he's just he's just randomly picked consciousness out as the 
kind of big thing that explains everything that then produces everything in reality is that a bit random and he kind of says to robert lawrence q next well no and yes <laughs> that any theory you pick um will always start with some base axiom the question is how good is that ingredient that you put in at the bottom if you like at producing the whole cake how good is putting that theory in there and working out what what it what it yields how good is it at predicting the actual reality of the world that we see okay how good a model is it and we should be able to test that and he's testing it mathematically and they're also thinking about how they can test it um we're doing experiments as well he talks about so back to lawrence uh robert lawrence kuhn and to um don uh, in the case of consciousness if you think about all the different aspects of consciousness that you might want in your theory there's um you know headaches and the smell of garlic and the, the taste of chocolate and and there's all these emotions there's somehow the notion that our experiences um, inform our actions. Maybe they inform them in, maybe one have a notion of free will or some kind of notion about how um, our behavior is influenced by um, our experiences. There's the notion of self. That, you know, and self-awareness and awareness of others. So, um, there's, there's countless things that, that you might want. There's, there's memory, right? I have experience of memories, learning, problem solving, intelligence. Well, there's tons of things that you would want your theory of consciousness to deal with. Now, if I just assume all those in my theory, well, that's not very, very good, right? I mean, if I assume and everything's a miracle, everything's just an assumption. So what, what I want to do is to say of all the features of consciousness, what is the minimal mm. set, the absolute bare minimal set of assumptions that I can make that I can then boot up a theory of consciousness that will give me everything else. I'll have to work for it, right? I'll have to work hard to get everything else because I didn't assume it. And so what I'm proposing, um, and you know, other people can have different starting points. My proposal is I need two things, conscious experiences, like the, the taste of garlic, the, the smell of a rose, a headache, those kinds of raw experiences as experiences. So I need to be able to say that they exist. So that's one of my assumptions. That's, so to speak, a miracle for me. Mm -hmm. And the other one is that those experiences non-trivially influence some kind of action. Now you can interpret that action in various ways. I tend to interpret it as free will, but, 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 but mathematically, all I need is that there's a probabilistic relationship. The experiences probabilistically affect the actions that, that occur in respect. Okay, that's, that's my assumption. And so then what I write down is what I call, this is very much in the spirit of like what Alan Turing did when he came up with the, the Turing machine, right? So what Turing was trying to do was to say, I would like a, a theory of computation, a, a, a minimal theory of computation. And in computation is really a, a wide ranging thing. I can compute the, the digits of pi, I can do the traveling salesman problem. There's lots of things that, that, that are involved in computation. What Turing boiled it down to was this trivial thing. I have a tape with some ones and zeros on it. I've got a set of transition rules and a set, finite set of symbols, a start state and whole state. And the claim is with that trivial set of assumptions, I can compute anything that's computable. That, that, that was the, so, so he didn't assume um, that he knew how to compute the digits of pi. He made that something you'd have to do. You'd have to build a Turing machine that computes the digits of pi and it's not easy to do and, and, and so forth. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm saying, let me give a minimal structure and it's about as complicated as a Turing machine, right? The, my, the structure that I'm writing down. It's a different structure than a Turing, but it's, it, it's not the same thing as a Turing machine, but it's, it, it's a minimal structure. It has a set of conscious experiences and a set of transition probabilities that those experiences will, will affect then the experiences of other experiencers right okay so really interesting there so what's he talking about in layman's terms i think he explained it fairly clearly but really he's kind of saying like every theory of reality that you might have starts 
has somewhere at its base a miracle, something that you're just going to grant, okay? So I don't know, you're talking about, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but like the Big Bang, you know, on models of the origins of the universe, you know, it might grant that space time just suddenly emerges, but not out of any fixed point beyond the Planck time, you know, it just, just, ooh, you've got a universe, okay? Whatever model you've got, you've got whether you start with there's, there's just a quantum field and it starts doing funky stuff, you're starting with a kind of basic ingredient that you can't reduce and explain in any other terms further back. So you start with a given, start with a miracle. Sometimes in philosophy, it's called a, an axiom. Um, so we're, you know, we're proposing a kind of an axiom of something existing, axiomatic thing. All right. And he's saying, well, I'm trying out consciousness. I'm trying out consciousness as my miracle. Grant me consciousness. And then, of course, he's saying, look, I don't want to necessarily, so how, how am I going to break it down? He's saying like, well, you know, I could start with billions of all sorts of types of conscious features and experiences and kind of units of consciousness, if you like. But I'm just going to try and start with like the base, uh, basic kind of few simple things and then see what comes out of that. And he says, you know, basically, I need to be able to get out of that. If I can get out of that, a really accurate model. Um, so, it's, so that model still predicts maybe even better than existing models, hopefully better than existing models all the other layers of reality then there's good reason to think the model is correct okay you can have it's interesting because you can have models that predict that are incorrect i mean for example you know before copernicus you had the what was it called i never pronounced it correctly the ptolemaic system you know that posited all sorts of strange epicycles of how the planets moved with the earth at the center and they worked out very convoluted and careful mathematics to show the, the mathematics that worked that kind of explained everything in relation to the earth at the center so you, you can do the mathematics but putting your axioms in different places so their axiom was putting the earth at the center all right but you know so, so you can have models where you get the axioms wrong but it's still you know you still come out with predictive mathematics um, that you can tell where what planet is going to be where or what at what time and so on so he could maybe don hoffman could be positing the wrong axiom in consciousness and doing the mathematics and there's all sorts of things that come out that are still accurate um i guess i one of the things i think that happened with the ptolemaic system is there are all sorts of fudges that had to be put in to try and make it work uh that weren't so, so it wasn't such a great explanation so i guess the test for his model is, are there fudges in it or is it a really good slick explanation of, you know, of all sorts of things that come out, space, time, relativity, theory of evolution, et cetera, et cetera. Does, does the universe that we know in our reality emerge out of his model? OK. And also, is it testable in some way? So that's the thing he's also trying to work on, not just the mathematics side of it, mathematical modeling, but also finding ways that they can test it. And he's working on that with his colleagues. OK, so um, what I want to look at next is um, the different video that I mentioned earlier on, um, where he talks about his new paper, his latest paper that's now published around what's called the fusions of consciousness. This is a really fascinating uh, uh, video, and I would encourage you, once you've watched mine, of course, but um, to, to go and then watch the whole of this other guy's uh, YouTube video, because it's a really fascinating interview. But here, what Don Hoffman, I'm going to give you the kind of bite-sized bits of it, um, what Don Hoffman is really explaining is his kind of version of reality, where you have levels of reality with conscious agents at the bottom that then divvy out into what's called like you get decorated permutations these are and then you get um various kind of geometric type things i'm not sure i understand it exactly but anyway follow along um and you've got these kind of geometric things so th and then you've got like space time out the top of that so what he's really exploring is levels of reality underneath space time with conscious agents that we were just talked about a minute ago as, as the base axiom at the bottom of this model OK, and what comes out of this is really interesting, the kind of way it shapes reality as this. Well, I'll let, let I'll, I'll let that him explain and then we'll, we'll look at this in chunks because it's absolutely mind blowing what it potentially shows reality is. And I think it actually has massive 
not just scientific it's a scientific theory but it also has a massive spiritual um and philosophical um consequences and connotations because it it just shows ultimate reality to be absolutely infinitely mind-blowing so anyway let's go to this next clip so in this clip they're going to explain the different levels of reality and how it all comes together because i think it might be helpful to okay so we have space time let's say it's up here or we're just gonna space time there's an amplitohedron that is should we think about it as an abstract object i mean is it we just say it's phys it's not physical right it's not a it's a geometric object that's geometric. entirely outside of space time so so gotcha. it's not you know, people have a hard time because we think of space time as fun yeah. how could something be outside space time give me a break mm -hmm. you know everything is inside space. no 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 so this is not some little structure inside you're like curled up instead of special dimensions inside space time like in string theory mm -hmm. you have all these little dimensions that are curled no no this is in the amplitudehedron could have billions of dimensions mm -hmm. and it's a so it's a geometric structure okay outside of space-time and space-time is a in some sense trivial projection of this much deeper gotcha. structure. only ee keeps you connected when you run out of data ee stay connected data projection so no. the epithetron so don't think of it as a, a substance it doesn't have the material kind of component no. So let's say underneath that, <laughs> and please st stop me where I'm wrong. If you can correct me, that'll be super helpful. Please don't sure. like, uh, sometimes people are polite and they want to say, oh, it's fine. Let, don't let me get away with anything. <laughs> you know, correct me because that'll be the most helpful. So then you, un underneath that, you have decorated permutations, which would you say feed into the amplitohedron or the amplitohedron is like, um, a, say, a, a, a layer of glass that sort of, allows a projection through it. Like, can you help, um, and this is where analogy would probably be helpful beyond say the math for a lay audience and myself, uh, but how does that interaction, what is the interaction there between those two levels? And should we think of them as levels? They are, and yeah. and in some sense, the what's remarkable is that the the decorated permutations, which are, I mean, permutations, what are they? They're like, if you have a deck of cards and you're shuffling them, every the shuffle is a permutation. Right. Right, right. So a decorated permutation is basically, you know, a mathematical description of shuffles. It has, it's called decorated because it has a little twist. <laughs> we can go into the twist if you want, but it, but <laughs> it may not be necessary here. <laughs> but given a decorated permutation, you can construct an amplitudehedron. You know, you oh, okay. mathematics that's called it. You you put a differential form on it, and so you, in some sense, the decorated permutation remarkably has almost all of the invariant physical information about particle scattering hmm. and but you use use it and some mathematical tools to then construct the amplitudehedron and is and the amplitudehedron the volumes of this geometric object are hmm. the scattering amplitudes so it's, it's, right. so the so you can see, so the, the decorated permutations are this deep abstract structure. They allow you to construct this object called the amplitudehedron and other structures. That and the volumes of those structures then are, in fact, the amplitudes for like two gluons smashing into each other and four gluons spraying out mm -hmm. and things like that. Okay, so um, they're going into quite a bit of detail there, and I want to jump forward next to think about the conscious agents part of it at the bottom and what he describes there. So, um, without any further ado basically let's jump straight to the next section right the simplest question what makes um uh these individual things in your model <laughs> agents like what gives them like um can you define can you make it as simple as possible maybe describe what one of these things is or what two of these agents are and how they interact right so the the mathematics really is modeling a very simple idea that an agent can have an experience like it experiences uh, it, it sees red and then based on what it experiences what it sees it decides um, how it's going to affect other agents what it's going to do to the other agents and then once it 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 makes that decision it then affects the experiences of other agents 
So yeah. think about it as like the Twitterverse it means I, 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 I get a tweet. So someone, uh, so I get a percept, you know, that it's the tweet and I read it and I decide, oh, you know what? Um, I think I will retweet that and I will then send it to my followers. So, so that's my choice. And I then retweet it. And now I'm affecting the perceptions of, you know, mm. however many followers I have, or I can just say, no, you know, that's not a, that, that wasn't a very interesting tweet. Um, or, or I'm going to comment on this tweet. I'm, uh, you know, I think this tweet was, is interesting, but wrong. So I'm going to say this and then send, so you can see there's all sorts of, so I get perceptions, namely in this analogy tweets, mm. I make decisions, I, I'll tweet or not, or I'll tweet with some comments. And then I take an action. I send it out into the Twitterverse to my followers. And, and so that's what, a, that basically that's the big idea of, of a conscious agent. And the Markovian mm. dynamics is basically just saying, um, <clears throat> Model all that I just said with probabilities. So it's so really interesting. I'll let him carry on in a second. But basically seeing here at the fundament of reality, suggesting that you've got subjectivity and ex experiencing entities, units, features of consciousness um, that decide and that have effects and that are networked. Really interesting. So that they're networked and in a sense, they form a kind of multiplicity within a unity. And he'll talk later on about how that multiplicity within that unity has an infinite array of variations within it. But I'll let him carry on for the moment. So, I mean, it, it's probabilistic. Who, who is my followers? Right. And, and, and So as, as soon as you just take everything I said and just say everything that I just said, just do it with probabilities, you get a Markovian dynamics coming out of it. Sure. And so how does... Um... I guess, like you said, the color example, and that's, I believe, what's in the paper, the if Q1 and Q2, red and green, right? So if, if you, the one agent, the uh, getting the red experience, let's say, perceiving red, how do they decide what to do with that? <laughs> like, what's the uh, right. so, decision based on that? So if you have, uh, suppose you have... So to pause for a minute, basically, they're talking about the idea that you might have uh, a basic unit of consciousness that is just experiencing red red experiencing and you might have another one that's green experiencing and they're like really simple boring basic kind of units of consciousness okay and then he's talking about how they network next what happens and what then comes out of that so i'll let them talk a little bit and then we'll move on you have um two agents and, and the one agent um only sees red and another agent only sees green well it, um it, it could send basically a, a message to another agent effectively um, saying, I, I saw red, oh, okay. But if the other agent, it, it, you have to have an agent that can interact, that, that can understand that. So it has to have the, so what we have to do then is talk about, for example, a, a, a combination agent where um, this agent can see either red or or green we can think about it that way and so what happens then is oh if the agent happens to see green now what's the probability that it will see green in the next instant or what's the probability that it will see red in the next instant so the way to think about it then is um if it's you, you think about a network it's it's the probabilities that the different agents are going to see be seeing different colors at different at different instants of the dynamics and so if agent one sees red, what is the probability that um, it will affect agent two um, and, and it will see green and, and so forth in, in, in the dynamics? Interesting. So what can you give us a sense of what kicks off this dynamic? Like, um, mm. I guess when you boot up, when, it, when you boot it up, what are the starting conditions? How does and how did the interactions, how did the dynamics begin? Well, it, it, so in a Markov dynamics, which you, you have, say, this agent that has, you know, 20, 20 colors that it can perceive. And the way we actually run the simulations, we say, well, let's, let's pick, let's say it starts with blue. So, and maybe that's color 14. So we say, okay, well, it's first, it's first experience is color 14. Now let's, let's see what happens. You know, um, if, if we have this Markovian kernel that's describing its, you know, its whole perception, decision, action cycle, right? It gets a perception, makes a decision about what it's going to do next, and then it acts, yeah. and that, that will affect its new perceptions, 
right? Sure. That would be, so we can sort of look at that whole loop, perception, decision, action, and and model just the sequence of the experiences that that agent will have. It, so then you can get a dynamic. So, well, first it saw blue, and then it saw red, and then it saw green. And and when we look at it long term, we can say, well, the probability that it sees blue is like a third. And the probability that it sees green is only a tenth, and the probability that it sees red is half or something like that. And so you can look at the long term, what is it seeing most of the time? What is it dwelling on? What are the experiences that it, that it spends most of its time with? And so hmm. forth. Those are the kinds of questions you can begin to answer. Interesting. So a one agent, let's say a one agent that, am I using that terminology right? Because mm -hmm. I think in a picture you say one agent's two agents, and two agents would be like a fusion of the two, I think. <laughs> so you have one agent, it's getting a color. What are its range of um, possible decisions that it can make based on that? Well, it basically... Okay, so this is interesting. I'll, just, I'll play this a little bit here and then we'll move on. Um, what it can do is, is effective, I'll use the Twitter analogy. Sure, yeah, yeah. This is a pretty poor Twitter user because it it, it, it harps on one thing only. I'm uh, only most Twitter red. users <laughs> are like that. So, so if you're interested in red, hey, I'm the guy, you know, and so... All, all this poor little guy can do, he's a very, very simple one. All he can do is, I just saw red. And so he tells all of his all of his followers, mm -hmm. I just saw red. So he's a pretty boring guy, right? He, but we have to start with these boring guys to build up the more complicated, sort of the way science works is you start off, model the most simple, boring. So this guy, all he can do is tweet, I saw red. And the other green Asian, all he can do is tweet, I saw green. Hmm. And and it can't put any comments on it. All it can do is, is say that. Now, when I get to a, a, a conscious agent that has you know fifty thousand states in it, you can start to get some complicated dynamics coming out of that agent, or or a trillion states. Now you can get something really. But but you, you don't want to start there as a scientist. You want to start. Sure, okay, yeah. Let's look at these boring agents. All this one can do is say, "I saw red." Boring. But but hey, you got to start there to work out the math. And, and make it all clean. Mm -hmm. So that's why we start with these boring agents. Yeah, so let's say, so it starts at the boring stage. <laughs> when is the first iteration or time, like, um, I'm not sure how you do this, if it's um, with T, is it T, is, is it, it iterates yeah, as it goes. Yeah. Let's at what step, when do you see like the first interesting thing happening that you can? Well, even with two agents, so we have these two boring agents and we have them interact already there, there is an infinity of ways that they can interact, an infinity of, of ways. Um, and it's in our paper, the Fusions of Consciousness paper, people can look at it. It's, it, it, we write down this, this thing called the, um, a Markov polytope M sub two. It's the, the set of all possible two by two Markovian matrices. Mm -hmm. So it's so, and as no, actually, it, for those who've had like any high school algebra, you probably saw you know matrix algebra where you learn to play with matrices and multiply matrices together. Well, this is just a matrix that has um, two rows and two columns. Mm -hmm. that, that's it. This, and yeah, all I'm the, looking at it right the, now. <laughs> the numbers in a row have to sum to one. That's it. That's the that's yeah. the, so it's a special kind of matrix where the the numbers are. Are not negative. They're 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 non-negative numbers. It was like they could be zero, any number between zero and one, but every number in a row has to all, all the numbers in a row have to sum up to one. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, that's so it's a simple kind of, of matrix. And when you look at that, you, you'll see that there are um, it's a a two-dimensional space of po literally a two-dimensional parameter space of possible. Markovian matrices, and, and therefore it's a an uncountable infinity, uh, literally an uncountable infinity of possible interactions between just these two. The two most boring agents already have an uncountable, a two dimensional uncountable infinity of possible interactions, and and they carry on there. Go to the main source if you want to find out more about that bit there. But really interesting how you, you're building up this sheer massive number of possible. Uh, things that can come out of these these you know um putative agents that he's postulating in his theory at the base so next thing i want to just move it on to is around 43 minutes we're going to get them to think about the the way in which these these parts form part of an absolute infinity which i think is uh really interesting so 43 there <laughs> because i was wondering i was thinking about this and I was thinking about fitness beats truth, 
And I was wondering, these conscious, these agents, right? Are they actually seeing truth or are they just modeling their own fictions? <laughs> like, you know, how far down does that idea go? Like, does it go down to this level or? Well, there's, that's a great question. And there's a couple levels to answer it. In some sense, if, if uh, I have a simple boring agent that only sees red, um, that's all the truth it knows. And it is true that it sees red, but it knows nothing else. It, it, it perhaps knows nothing more about all the other experiences of other agents that are out there. So it, it, what it knows is, is true, it sees red, but what it doesn't know is immense, <laughs> right? So its mm. truth is very, very partial. Um, but but it is it, it's true but incomplete and even an agent any agent other than the one right the, the, that one agent that i said which is the combination of all possible agents which i can't model any agent other than the one is in some sense trivial what it knows what it perceives is a trivial subset of of the truth known by the one mm. yeah really interesting to just pause there that is using a philosophical term. Those of you familiar with Platonism and Neoplatonism will recognize the one. So the one is the absolute. Um, in, in, in the Platonists thought of it as kind of like God, but it's the ground of being itself. It's not a thing. Um, and now quite in what sense Don Hoffman is using it here, whether that's the same or not is a, is a matter of debate, but he's kind of saying, you know, you've got the sum of all conscious agents, all parts of conscious knowledge, if you like, and parts of subjectivity, parts of deciding. So he talked earlier about the small agent, the, each little agent, if you like, kind of being, a subject that experiences but also decides and it has effects and it's networked in this network of agents and he says like as it, as it goes up you've really got basically an infinity of these kind of subjectivities within uh, um what would amount to the one but the one he says is even in principle impossible to to get around it is endless and infinite Okay, so the, and thinking about the possible combinations and so on. So that is just really interesting. I'm not quite sure what to make of that. Um, so, you know, is he saying, for example, like the whole of reality is made up of these small separate conscious bits that come together and make up the one, if you like, which would be kind of like God, the God consciousness, if you like, the absolute that knows everything or is the all the little kind of conscious agents that he's positing in his theory are they kind of something that come out of the one and when you'll hear him somewhere else if you look around his videos talk about in his modeling what they're trying to do is to he might even talk about it in a minute if i remember um that he does talk about it in a minute actually he talks about because the other guy talks about tell hard the shard the um philosopher and catholic priest who came up with some interesting theory his amiga point theory and he's saying look actually yeah this is where my model goes my model goes towards everything fusing so all of the conscious agents kind of coming together and reaching this kind of omega point um in this, he, he didn't seem to know about the tale, tale of the Chardin, but he's like yeah yeah basically that's the same idea um and then he says like is that also represented if you like in space time through like the like the, the singularity of the universe closing and re 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 collapsing back into one um so have we got consciousness this is the question have we got consciousness at the base of reality that is kind of doing a, a explode out explode in or if you like in terms of the conscious agents um kind of multiply out and then fuse back in that would be a really interesting idea does it happen it doesn't happen in time because he's saying this is happening this ultimately is beyond space time this is what it looks like in space time so here we've got something perhaps that goes on beyond space time that resembles uh the platonic idea of having the one and the emanation 
this idea of emanation and return that you get in um, Neoplatonic thinking, people like Plotinus. Remember, Plotinus is in what the fifth century AD. Um, so you've got this idea of the the one out of which emerges um, noose intelligence and and being and matter and so forth. That then kind of it, it kind of returns to its source, not necessarily in a chronological sense, but it's it's where it comes from. It's where it's it's where it's pointed as well. So yeah, the creation, if you like. Um, that's where it derives from, but it also what it points back to. Okay, so I'm going to let these guys carry on a bit, and then um, we'll just reflect on on these these lo these last points. Right, absolutely. So everything right. that that you know, the, the the smartest Einstein or Newton on the world could ever possibly know is trivial compared to um, what's known by the one, um, and 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 we can prove that you know given. If we assume this mathematical theory of conscious agents, that that any agent other than the one has, in some sense, trivial knowledge compared to what what the one knows. Mm. But but now our experiences of space and time now are true experiences as experiences. Where where we get wrong is if we say this is the final reality. Right, like if, if the if the the simple agent that just only saw red said, if it said if it just said I experienced red, that's true, absolutely true. If it goes on and says there's nothing else, red is the ultimate truth. Well, no, no, no. Now you're in fiction world. Now you're in absolute fiction world. Mm -hmm. So so it's true that I'm experiencing objects in space and time. That it's true that those are my experiences. What's false is to say that's the final reality. No, 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 no. That's 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 and it's really interesting okay one of the things that's leveled at theological models of the universe um people say well science try it's always trying to find more truth more more answers but theology just goes god full stop okay well see that doesn't work here does it because if what don hoffman is doing here which is he's doing science he's doing it mathematically and they're going to try and test it out in other ways as well you know if he's saying there's this ultimate mega uber ultimate agent that is just infinite there is no bound to its knowing because everything is within it like, like we are part of it like there is only one reality and it like you and i we are parts and we're, we're made up of small conscious agents in this view maybe it's our cells or i don't know goodness knows what but you know basically the whole kind of you know we're, we're part of the whole reality but the ultimate reality is endless so that doesn't put you in anywhere near a position and it's certainly not putting don hoffman in position of saying well positing something like this and, and saying well yeah that's just a nice simple answer i know it all um he's actually saying no his answer in its very nature in principle offers you a kind of entity i'm going to put that in inverted commas that is boundless that is uh that you would want to explore forever okay so it's really interesting he don't often talks about how he, he sees this kind of overlap between spiritual ideas that he think he thinks are really interesting and valid and what he's trying to do is is, is take a different route but doing it through mathematics and he said you know you get similar ideas coming out um but yeah uh, that's you know that breaks down that whole classic kind of science versus religion or science versus spirituality divide he's using the scientific methodology okay so he's not just plucking it out of the air in terms of some sort of well i'm just intuiting spiritually what the truth is he's trying to work at this really rigorously like really rigorously um but there's no conflict in his mind between the sorts of models of the world you, we might end up with uh between spirituality and science I'm actually going to stop there and let you, if you want to find out more, go highly recommend this particular video. Um, go, and, go and pursue that. And uh, thank you for listening. I think it opens up tons and tons of really interesting questions. 
Um, thank you for listening. Please do uh, hit that like button. Do subscribe because we'd love to send you more stuff in the future. And uh, please do leave a comment. I tr make a real effort to try and interact with people that leave comments. So if you want to have a conversation with me about this or, you know, each other on the comments, please do that. And also please share because um, we're a growing channel. But um, I would love to see this stuff reach out a lot further to a lot more people. So please generously share uh, the videos you watch as well. Thank you so much for listening. Take care.